Very well, very well indeed, yeah. Welcome. Um, sorry, there's someone just at the door. I'll just have to, have to go and sort this out. This uh, who's delivery. answering the door? Thank you. This is the delivery. Uh, yeah, it probably almost certainly is. Um, uh, A few more um, minutes. Uh, okay. Um, uh, here we go. Won't be a second. I'm so sorry. I just need to sort one very quick thing out. No problem. Um, there we go. Uh, that's all sorted out now. So um, uh, where are we? Sorry about this. There we are. And then what I could do is I've got the screen ready to share uh, whenever we need it. Yeah, just yes, a second. Yes. We're just saying in a few minutes hello to everyone. People are still uh, joining. That's super. Thank you. Oh, it's good that we're being recorded. That's excellent. We, uh, we wouldn't want to, to miss having the opportunity to go back to the session, Rory. Excellent. Hello, Chantal. Hello. We're seeing your picture. Where are you, Chantal? Right near Laura. <laughs> Where is Laura? <laughs> so, uh, as we are getting very close to start, uh, I just want to say that uh, we are a nice, a nice community that uh, decided to spend time together this afternoon. Uh, it's vastly made of advertising and uh, marketing and communications people, uh, be it client side, be it agency uh, side, um, and that uh, IAA basically is uh, gathering us. Uh, and um, Rory, we are uh, super thrilled to, to have you today with us opening actually the series of uh, connectivity for better webinars so uh, we've seen you last uh, last autumn here in bucharest at the creativity for better we still believe in creativity uh, and we know that you also do believe in creativity uh, but you know with all this uh, stay at home and isolation uh, reality we felt that uh, we need connectivity more than uh, maybe ever we did before so uh, this is how we decided to bring together connectivity for better and uh, you are the one to open the series thank you very much indeed and now it's officially 3 p.m romania 1 p.m uk and we are going to be as uh, british as possible on punctuality not romanians because romanians are not uh, punctual uh, we, we, we are to not be honest we're, we're not that punctual either to be absolutely honest yeah, um, but i think the reputation is uh, is promoting this part so uh, you know it's a good motivation for the romanians to be on time <laughs> of course well i'm very happy to kick off but i'll kick off slowly so if anybody wants to join a bit later they won't miss too much shall i do that so I'll I will stop. actually use just one more minute to... Oh, one more minute, that's fine. Um, people uh, would normally already know you, would already have read about you and about uh, the books you have written about. They have already uh, listened your TED Talks. Uh, but just for everyone to be, to be on the same page, uh, Rory is not only vice chair of Ogilvy UK, which is one of the greatest advertising agencies in UK and across the world, uh, but I think what is uh, even more impressive for Rory is that he's truly uh, creating, um, bringing challenges in the advertising industry and pushing the advertising industry to go beyond its limits, to get out of uh, our, let's say, comfort zone and to go and uh, be true uh, influencers out there in the economics world, in the uh, political world and so on, through being a pioneer on uh, behavioral science. Uh, and. Um, I think that the messages and the ideas that uh, uh, you Rory are promoting on behavioral science are making uh, a true impact not only in brand building and in advertising world, but surely in the, in the larger world. 
uh, today's session, we know that it is going to be a bit of looking back in order to create courage for the future, for the next 30 years. We are super thrilled to, to hear your challenges towards us and to really, really shake us. We need to be shaken. Um, and yeah, today's session is going to be uh, the first hour with you, uh, with a split of uh, you sharing uh, great ideas and challenges, and then a session of Q&As with, uh, with uh, the participants. And then we will stay a bit longer uh, to have a bit of a debate of, you know, uh, digesting the ideas that we are going to share. So without any further ado, please, you have the microphone. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you yes. very much indeed. Uh, here we go. What do I want to share? Desktop. I want to share that. So let's start adding that. I hope that's working well, is it? Yes. Um, yes. And, and let's hope that if I go on to the next slide, uh, okay, uh, is this working? Hold on. Um, uh, uh, hold on. I may need to do something rather clever. Uh, I need to put it in. Um, uh, I, I, if I'm right, I need to put it in into a uh, uh, presentation view. Is that right? Is that better now? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So I start by calling this "Where did it all go wrong?" And I think um, if you look back over my 30 years working in advertising. I think something happened which we all noticed digital. No one can say that, you know, the revolution in digital advertising went unnoticed. In fact, for about 10 years, there wasn't an advertising conference that wasn't 80% about digital. But I think two other things happened um, which we didn't really notice. In fact, it was a bit like the 2008 financial crisis where, although I think we can say that um, intervention by governments and central banks was beneficial in many ways. The great problem was that it allowed everybody to carry on as if nothing had changed. And the two things where I think that happened are, one, the nature of the clients that we have changed and we didn't notice. And secondly, the way we were paid changed as advertising, as creative advertising agencies, and we didn't really notice that either. And both of them, I think, were much more significant than we realized. So the first one is, in terms of um, the nature of clients, uh, in, let's say, well, actually, as recently as 1995, two-thirds of advertising spend was for packaged goods. It was for Unilever, for P&G, for chocolate bars, for alcoholic drinks, for beers, um, for dishwasher tablets. It was packaged goods companies who were our big clients and they were our big advertisers. Now, that's under a quarter. It's gone from being by far the dominant part of advertising to a minority part of it. And that's certainly true in the UK. The really big advertisers now might be broadband providers, mobile phone networks, mobile phone handset manufacturers. Um, it might be um, satellite television broadcasters. Uh, it might be insurance comparison websites. Uh, it may be online businesses of a various kind. But the culture within those new businesses is much less marketing friendly and much less focused on marketing than the culture within a Procter & Gamble or a Reckitt or a Unilever or a Cadbury or any of those uh, entities. And that makes our job much, much more difficult because the role of the marketer, that's our client, is much, much more junior in a tech company than it is in a soap company. The people we deal with have much less power and influence because the amount of money they spend is much less as a proportion of the cost of operation. Uh, you know, if you're Shell, for example, or if you're BP or, or for that matter, um, if you're, um, well, Vodafone, the amount you spend on advertising is a relatively small part of your overall budget. And so as a result, something that's less expensive comes with less power. Um, it's more prone to having cost cuttings applied to it because it's less powerful and it's fundamentally less influential. The chance that your marketing director sits on the board or that there's a marketing person on the board at all goes from being likely to infinitesimally rare. And Tim Harford, 
who's an economist and a brilliant writer in the UK, once asked me a very interesting question. He said, why do you people find your job so difficult? He said, I said, what do you mean? You know, he said, well, why do you find it difficult selling the importance of added value, perceived value, brand value, whatever you want to call it? And I said, well, it just is really difficult because it's intangible and the people we talk to don't really believe in it. And in many cases, I think, if you've got an engineering mentality, the way you want to win is through superior product design, through superior software, superior you know, product, what you might call objective product differentiation is how you want to win because that's where your status comes from. And winning through marketing is almost seen as cheating or a second best. And Tim Harford said to me, but all you have to say surely is Apple. Here you have the one tech company that took branding and perception seriously, and it's worth more than most of the other tech companies put together. It's worth a trillion dollars. Now, what you have to understand is Apple is a complete outlier because the man who ran it, the visionary behind it, was really if you can describe him as anything, and he defies categorization in the way that many entrepreneurs do, but Steve Jobs was a marketer. And indeed, there was considerable hostility to him within Apple at times. Uh, you know, one famous, very senior engineer was recorded as saying, I don't understand what Steve even does. I mean, he can't even code. And so we're dealing with businesses which don't have a marketing first culture. And the second thing I think that's changed is the way we've been paid. And we haven't been paid on commission since 1990, okay? I mean, genuinely, I don't think Ogilvy has a client now that still pays us on media commission. And um, pretty much by, you know, the early 1990s, and that's 30 years ago, we stopped being paid on media commission. And yet we still behave as though we were. The muscle memory of how we work is somehow so strong that the mentality of new business, the mentality of account people within the agency, is all about a hunger to produce bought communication of some shape or form. But two things have happened. First of all, that's the obvious part. Digital has completely changed the media landscape. But secondly, we missed a complete opportunity. There was bad news to not being paid on commission. The glorious thing about being paid on commission is that occasionally, several times a year, you would make an extraordinary amount of money for not doing very much. You know, at 17.5% commission, if your client decided to rerun last year's advertising because it was demonstrably effective and they were running the same creative across Europe, you would make several million pounds for essentially booking the media. Okay, so all of that disappeared. And we suffered the loss of those kind of asymmetric upsides. But we suffered the loss, but we never spotted the opportunity. And the opportunity of not being paid on commission was that we no longer needed to confine our efforts to those very small subset of marketing problems, which came with a large media budget attached. Creativity plus insight, creativity plus human insight, has an application to thousands and thousands of problems, of which only a small percentage are actually owned by someone who also owns a media budget. So we had an opportunity to make the business 10 times bigger, and we completely missed it. I mean, if you look at the growth in management consultancy, very few management, management consultants have a mentality which is, if you've got a problem, we can help you with it. They don't say we only deal with marketing problems. They, we only deal with uh, bought media problems. We only deal with digital social. We only deal with search engine optimization. We only deal with digital transformation. A management consultancy essentially claims, credibly or not, that they're open to solving pretty much any business problem that arises. Now, when those problems are highly reductionist and can be highly simplified in mathematical terms, management consultancies are probably bright enough to solve them well. When those problems have a component of human behavior involved, I would argue that management consultants often do it very, very badly. But they're the only people in the room because the ad agency is entirely focusing on the Marcom's aspect of the problem. What do we say? 
not the hundreds of other solutions they could be providing, which could generate just as much value. Now, that made sense when we were paid on commission, because if you did favours for your clients in other realms, you didn't get paid. But now we're paid by the hour. We don't need to confine the people we talk to to the marketing department. We don't need to confine our new business efforts to uh, people uh, in very large corporations with large um, media budgets. We can go out into the wider world. And what I've discovered through doing behavioral science is the first thing we discovered, it was never intentional. We discovered purely by accident that for every person in a marketing department who has an appetite for our services, there are 50 people somewhere else in the world who have the same appetite, but nobody from the creative industries was talking to them. And we suddenly lost the ability to talk to people who don't go to can. And for everybody who goes to can in business, there are a thousand people who don't go and another thousand people who wouldn't be seen dead there. And we need to learn to talk to them. It's, simple, it's as simple as that. Because they don't have media budgets, but they've still got problems and they've still got budgets. And I mean this really, really strongly. And the other thing that happened is when we started getting paid by the hour, the account people and the finance people who ran the business started, bear in mind that payment by the hour kind of coincided with the invention of the spreadsheet. And suddenly the account people looked at what made the money and what made the money was time consuming, large, laborious projects because it involved a lot of people and allowed you to sell a lot of hours. But what creates value in a creative agency is almost the opposite of that. It's a small occasional group of rock stars once in a while coming up with a blinding insight or a blinding creative approach, which nobody even anticipated beforehand. And so the entire financial incentivization of the creative agency is almost at odds with creating an agency that is really valuable to clients. It's economic value. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that um, free markets don't work. Free markets work very, very well when there's a high correlation between the value you add and the money you make. In advertising, there is almost no correlation as a creative agency between the value you add and the money we make. And there are cases where you can go into a small business with a fairly small budget and you can change the world. You can add four words to a call center script and you can double the response rate. You can change the way something's presented in a product page in e-tail, e e and you can multiply your sales by 10, literally by 10, okay? Advertising is very effective. I'm going to talk about this later. I'm not disputing that we should do advertising because advertising is an important tool in the armory, but it's not the only tool. There are hundreds of other tools to which you can deploy creative people and planners and good account people to solving a wide array of client problems, which is a much, much bigger um, arena in which to play than the one in which we decide to confine ourselves. And we should do small. We don't. We should do much more B2B. We don't. Here's just a lovely little example, which I didn't share when I came out because I only learned it very recently from Richard Shotton, who is the author of an absolutely excellent book uh, called The Choice Factory, which I recommend you all read. It's a fabulous book. Now, this is an example of how you can create magic for even small businesses. OK, you know, a business that would never be an advertising client. But you can still create thousands and thousands of pounds worth of value for them, even millions in this case, I would argue. And if you can get paid, you know, 30,000 pounds or 40,000 pounds, even better if you can be paid through a share of the gains, that's a business worth having. I would also argue, and this is a total aside, but it's relevant to our moment now, that the invention of Zoom and decent video conferencing completely expands the solution set for the kind of people you can work for. Because the cost of doing business with smaller businesses has gone from being just as high as servicing a large business to being more or less zero. We work with people like the Thames Valley Police, people we never would have worked with had I not 
created this behavioral science practice. And the, one of the great things is, is if they're happy for you not to travel and see them, and they're happy to do Zoom meetings, 10 of us can add hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of value for the police in an afternoon. And because Zoom enormously reduces the time cost, effort cost, and financial cost of liaising with those people, because you can essentially have a virtual meeting nowhere. Again, Zoom is another force which vastly expands the scope of people with whom you can do business. If you're Romanian, you can now do business with California. Okay? Because I'll give you a tip, and I shouldn't be giving this away. You can, you can, you can close deals on Zoom. You can't close deals by phone or by email. And so if you, you know, if, if, if you find a client in California, in fact, you can do business with them very effectively because if they need to speak to you urgently, you're nearly always free at nine o'clock at night, which is midday in California. I'm not suggesting you work at nine o'clock every night. I'm simply saying that your geographic scope of the people you work with can expand enormously as well. Now, this is an example of a small business with a brilliant idea, okay? It's called the Magic Castle Hotel. And as you can see from uh, the costs on uh, TripAdvisor, okay, uh, it's actually, it doesn't look, it's not the Four Seasons. Should I say that, okay? It's not the Intercontinental, right? And yet, as you can see, the cost of a room is really quite high. It's £220, probably about $270 a night. It's not, the swimming pool is tiny, you know, the architecture is slightly dated, it's painted a strange colour yellow, and yet, weirdly, it's the sixth best rated hotel in Los Angeles on TripAdvisor. It's probably beating quite a few five-star hotels in terms of customer popularity. How do they do that? Well, they deploy a bit of whether they know it's behavioral science or not, they deploy a bit of clever behavioral science. Now, as you can see from the rooms, it ain't the Ritz, okay? Now, by the way, I make a very clear point here. You can also see that the rooms are pretty clean. You know, the gardens are well maintained. Um, uh, you, know, uh, there's, you know, there's no scuffing on the walls. The, 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 the towels are perfectly clean and neatly folded. The bathroom, uh, the toilet is sanitized. That's an American preoccupation, largely. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting you can run a fantastic hotel, which is rubbish, by, simply, by, getting, by using magic instead. But nonetheless, what you can see is it's very, very clean and functional and nice, but it ain't the Four Seasons. It isn't the Mandarin Oriental. And why might that be? Swimming pool's not very big. Now, there's a little clue in the background in this photograph. They do two or three eccentric little things that to a rational person working at the Intercontinental would seem absurd, but which to the human brain just seem disproportionately appealing. And you can see in the background, if you can read very, very clearly, Popsicle Hotline. If you're by the pool, you pick up your, um, uh, your phone and people will come out with an enormous tray of ice lollies on demand any time the pool's open. It's silly. It's gratuitous. You could have a freezer there, couldn't you, and just let people help themselves. No, it's a popsicle hotline, so you can pick it up and ask, and someone will come out. Notice a few other little details, that when you get your laundry back, there's a smiley-faced hand drawn on it. It's wrapped in brown paper tied with string, and there's a sprig of, I think it's lavender, if I'm right, just attached to your... Um, uh, uh, your laundry. Now, I've stayed at, you know, five-star hotels all over the place. You know, I've seen some nice treatment of laundry. I've never seen the sprig of lavender before. It's just one of those things that shows you care. In other words, it achieves disproportionate mental saliency in proportion to its cost. And this is fully explained by something in behavioral science, which I'm very, very fond of. It's called the Carnot model. And Professor Carnot was, uh, was a professor of marketing, I think, at the University of Tokyo. He's still alive. He worked a great deal with the consumer electronics industry. Now, he argues that products and services, both the same, 
have three different kinds of attributes. Threshold attributes are what you might call table stakes in poker. You, you know, they're what you have to pay to play. If, you, if you're a brand of soft drink and 10% of your cartons leak, no one's going to buy your drink. It doesn't matter how good your drink is. It doesn't matter what else you do. No one's going to buy your drink. Okay, that's a threshold. Now, equally, threshold attributes scale sublinearly. Because once you reach the threshold, it doesn't create any particular happiness. No one goes, oh, I'm really loyal to Coca-Cola because every time I buy a can of Coke, the can doesn't leak. Okay? It doesn't get you that kind of incremental thing. Then there are performance attributes, which are often surprising. These are the things that rational people focus on. Because they're the things which are surprisingly closely correlated to the central function of the product or service itself. They tend to be things you can quantify mathematically, you know, the size of a hotel room, the speed of a computer processor, the, um, the length of a wait to be answered on a telephone call center. Okay, and they're the rational things that everybody measures and everybody cares about. And it's not wrong to care about those things because the better you are, the more people like you. But it's still only a linear relationship. And then at the top, you see something called excitement ratios, uh, excitement attributes. And what's exciting about them is they're often surprisingly irrelevant to what the product itself is supposed to do, but they disproportionately contribute to customer satisfaction. They scale up supralinearly. And an example of this in the Japanese consumer electronics field in which Kano was involved would have been the eject mechanism on a DVD player or earlier on a cassette deck. <coughs> because even though no one asked in market research what's really important to you about a cassette deck, no one would say, oh, it's the eject mechanism. I can cope with poor sound quality. I don't really care too much about battery life or build quality. But boy, do I love an eject mechanism. Nevertheless, if you made the um, eject mechanism sort of hydraulic, damped, counterweighted, so that your cassette deck hissed open, rather like a science fiction door on Star Trek or something, people absolutely loved that. And it had a disproportionate effect on their propensity to buy the product, out of all proportion to its cost. Now, these things, unlike performance attributes, tend to be irrational. Accountants tend to hate them. In fact, they're the first thing that the finance department will kill if your budget gets cut. And arguably, they maybe should be the last thing you kill. And it's a beautifully, beautifully simple model that you can apply to more or less anything. What have we done here to do something which just makes this experience just a little bit nice? Okay? And so... Um, there's a wonderful example. We've been talking to the police about how you encourage people to uh, self-isolate and stay apart in public. And um, one of the things you can do is instead of going over to people and telling them off, you can go over to people and say, I wonder if you can do me a favor. Because the way people respond emotionally to a request is different depending on how you, how you word it. And a policeman asking you to do a favor is actually more likely to get you excited and interested than a policeman bossing you around. We have a very strong aversion to being told what to do. And so that's a simple example of something where if you don't have any marketers present in the decision-making group, the excitement attributes won't be invented in the first place or they'll be the first thing to kill off. I would argue from a marketing point of view that one of the biggest sources of competitive advantage a company can have is the ability to do things that the finance director doesn't like. Because if you allow finance or engineers to have too much power, they'll understand the threshold attributes because they understand those kind of problems. They're closed-ended problems with a certain definable solution and they know what they're aiming for. Excitement attributes are open-ended uh, um, uh, problems where there can be more than one correct answer and where indeed the opposite of a good idea can be another good idea. Maybe you want to make the opening really fast, maybe you want to make it really slow, you just don't want to make it average. That might be an example of an excitement attribute. Most successful businesses woefully undervalue those attributes in defining why a product's successful. 
particularly if they're engineering companies. James Dyson wants to believe that the reason his vacuum cleaners are successful is because they're bagless and they don't lose suction over time. I would argue that a vastly underestimated reason for their popularity is that they look really, really cool. You know, for the first time, you actually like looking at and unboxing your vacuum cleaner in a way that was unthinkable 20 years ago, when buying a vacuum cleaner was purely a distress purchase. Here's an example in architecture. I mentioned this, I think, when I was out in Bucharest last time, uh, which is just to say that... Um, uh, uh, you know, when they reopened St Pancras Station, the PR company, I'll give them credit, Freud Communications, uh, the brilliant idea of discovering <coughs> an almost irrelevant but very memorable fact about the station, <coughs> which is that it contained, that's me drinking tea, that's not me with coronavirus, <coughs> I just, some tea went the wrong way, I'm sorry. Um, they put, um, they discovered that the station contained the longest champagne bar in Europe. That went out on all their press releases. Because it was a good little factoid, every single news um, outlet seemed to report this fact. As an example of how opulent it was, it achieved something magical. It's totally inappropriate, you know, totally irrelevant. Nobody ever goes, I'm thinking of going to a champagne bar this evening. Does anybody know any long ones, right? Or I never go to that champagne bar anymore. It's not long enough. It is a completely sort of orthogonal um, form of attribute. It's, you know, it's not central to the, uh, you know, function of a champagne bar. Nevertheless, because everybody remembers... Um, uh, the fact that um, uh, it contains a large champagne bar, it completely reshaped everybody's perception of the station from being a utilitarian transit hub to being a destination in its own right. This is what I mean by, if you don't have any marketers in a room, someone who spent half a billion pounds renewing a station doesn't want to talk about a champagne bar. A car company that spent a quarter of a billion pounds creating a new form of transmission doesn't want to talk about the uh, heads up display but what consumers care about and what engineers think is important are not very well correlated at all so here we go why do we confine ourselves why are we so self-limiting why do we confine ourselves to solving only those problems that come with a media budget attached there's a case of freud communications in a single insight of pure wonderful genius i'd hire the person if i knew who it was who came up with that fact and discovered it um suddenly can transform our perception of a 500 million pound uh station renovation simply by telling a little bit of carno story now the other reason it's absolutely vital that we start talking about behavioral science, we start talking about um, consumer behavior, insights, psychology. Um, the other reason is that the second a client, and we've allowed this to happen, the second a client believes that marketing and Marcoms are the same thing, we're all dead. Marketing's dead and marketing services companies are dead and advertising agencies are dead. Because in most companies, communication is not part of their strategic thinking, for the most part. And the second the marketer becomes a Marcoms person, you've gone from being a, an important and highly valuable and indeed essential and non-replicable member of any senior decision-making team, the person who gives the customer viewpoint um, and the psychological viewpoint in decisions which in their absence will only be taken by experts in finance and logistics who don't understand psychology very well. And you've gone from that C-suite role to being a support function. And support functions never influence shit, right? Maybe they should, actually, you know, maybe support, maybe in Ogilvy we've made the great mistake that I, as the vice chairman, should spend more time in talking to the people who man reception, because they may have insights that, that, um, uh, that, that I simply don't have about what clients find annoying, what clients find appealing. Maybe they should be influential, but the simple, brutal truth is they ain't. Secondly, they're not only positioned as a support function, the second that marketing becomes Marcom's, they're also positioned as a cost, not a source of value creation.
And so basically you're the first people to get hit uh, when um, problems strike. And so it's an absolutely vital question uh, here uh, that we don't actually become stereotyped as a Markov's function. So that, I think, is one thing that behavioral science can help prevent. And why does it help prevent it? It helps prevent it because it uses a different vocabulary. The vocabulary of marketing is, you know, talking about brand iconography is only of any value when you're talking to marketing people. You're talking to your pre-existing client base. If you want to talk to anybody outside marketing, the language of marketing is actually dangerous because it makes you sound flaky and mad. And the really valuable thing that behavioral science provides us with before it provides us with anything else is it provides us with a vocabulary we can use in talking to people in finance, in talking to people in logistics, in talking to people in spheres and silos of business which aren't marketing focused. I'll tell you a very quick anecdote which um, was shared to me on a podcast um, uh, by a very brilliant marketer in the UK who said, Someone from very good from his data team was moved into marketing because marketing needed a data expert. And he said to the marketing director, he said, I was pretty worried when I heard they were moving me into marketing because I was always rubbish at art. Now, that problem, I think, literally pervades every area of business outside marketing. That once you're stereotyped as comms, you're, a, you're an arty, flaky support function. You're not a strategic partner to anyone involved in decision making. And that to us is terrifying. And yet once we move out of that obvious function, we can move into extraordinarily exciting, game-changing business ideas that are based on a foundation of three things. Uh, behavioral science and just our natural innate talent for human insight. Creativity, which is the ability to envisage things that don't necessarily emerge directly from the information you have. The ability to hypothesize well. And the third thing is real world testing. The ability to, to not only tell people what you think might be worth testing, but to prove or determine where your, um, uh, where your scientific intuition is right where your creative intuition is right and where it's wrong. I have a lot of faith in, in intuition of experienced marketers, but my faith is not absolute. And wherever you can test, emphatically you should. And those three things create a framework upon which marketing can turn itself from an arty support function to a genuinely essential um, business um, contributor with a scientific base. And the example I tell, the reason there's a picture of pizza on the screen, with Pizza Hut, we said, you assume that everybody wants your pizza as soon as possible because 99% of people order their pizza for delivery ASAP. We know about behavioral science, and behavioral science tells us that the context in which you ask a question, and the way in which you ask a question, and the defaults which are implicit in the question, affect the way people answer the question. Now, why does this matter? It matters because if you could get 40 or 50% of people to wait a bit longer for their pizza, you could deliver three people's pizza on one bike. You could do, make the 30 minute delivery, then you go on to making the 38 minute delivery, and then the 43 minute delivery that's 500 yards away before the bike has to return to base and pick up another delivery. This would hugely reduce uh, the cost of delivery, both in terms of the labor involved and indeed the carbon emissions involved. It would make delivery efficient um, because you could batch process a large part of each journey. And sure enough, we got people to test it and we changed the default from ASAP to maybe a time of day. Would you like your pizza at 8.15? Is 8.15 okay or would you like it sooner? At the time, the default on the app was ASAP. The default on the website was ASAP. And if you rang anybody up, they never asked when would you like it. They just assumed you were in a hurry. So the implicit default there was also ASAP. When you change that, either in the spoken conversation or in the norm, the default setting for the website or the mobile phone, what you found is that you could push the delay out from 30 minutes to an hour without losing any sales. 
you could then put more than one pizza on each delivery to a particular local postcode area, saving you a great deal of money. Weirder still, we didn't just measure the efficiency of the behavior, we measured customer satisfaction. To be honest, we expected customer satisfaction to stay the same or go down. To our complete amazement, it went up by 50%. We still don't fully understand the science behind that, but it may be that if you ask for your pizza at 8.30 and it arrives at 8.28, you're really impressed because it's punctual. Whereas if you ask for your pizza as soon as possible, you're left in tenterhooks for 15 minutes wondering when the pizza's going to get there. It may be that simply having a definite time of arrival reduced the anxiety of waiting. But so far, I must explain that's simply a hypothesis and it's in need of further testing. Because if we can find out what it is that contributed to this 50% improvement in satisfaction, we can deploy the same insight maybe in lots of different places. And here's the tip for lots of different clients. Because here's a great thing about behavioral science as distinct from advertising you can sell the same insight more than once. A brand campaign is so specific to the client's own brand that once you've sold it, they can't buy it from anybody else. Okay, so your ability to sell it on is highly limited. On the other hand, in behavioral science world, actually, you can take an insight from pizza delivery and you can apply it to a police force or a train company and you can actually build up a body of knowledge which is reusable. So that's fabulous. We can solve loads of problems which engineers assume are engineering problems by using psychology. One of the questions I asked about train overcrowding is before you solve train overcrowding, it might be worth asking a question, which is why do people hate standing on trains so much? Now, part of it is just being in close proximity with other people. But part of it may be that there's no story you can tell yourself about why you would want to stand on a commuter train. In other words, the people who get the seats get everything. The people who get stand get nothing. The people who get the, the, can sit down, get a view out of the window, they get a plug, they get a table to put their laptop on, they can use their tablet, they can listen to headphones, and they can read a book. They've got a place that's safe to put their bag because there's a table. So they're pretty safe that nobody can steal their bag out of the table. The person who has to stand has to stand in the middle of the train. They get no view. Okay. Uh, they get no plug. They get nowhere to use a laptop. They have to hold on to something to stop themselves falling over. So as a result, they lose the use of one hand, which means they can't even use their mobile phone or comfortably read a newspaper. What if you redesigned the train? So there was a trade-off. So people who stood, stood and leaned against a ledge next to the window, which had USB charging ports, a nice view, and a nice little ledge on which they can put their laptop, and maybe a bum rest or something against which they could lean. The people sitting down simply got a seat and were in the middle of the train. If you change the relative quality of two things, you can actually make everybody happier. Because now the people who stand go, actually, I'd prefer to stand. And the people who sit tell themselves a story about why they prefer to sit down. As things stand, it was all or nothing. The people who weren't seating, who were paying for train tickets like everybody else, felt cheated. If you change the design of a train, you can change the amount of happiness created. If you change the design of a waiting room so that once you've seen people, you show them through into a second waiting room, they're much less annoyed at being made to wait than if you send them back to the original waiting room. That's an extraordinary insight, which means that people who are only targeting the duration of a customer or patient wait in an institution have probably used the wrong metric that the duration of the wait does not map neatly onto the degree of patient annoyance. And that there are hacks you can do, very, very simple things you can do, which can make waiting much, much less annoying, even if market research will never tell you these things and conventional economic logic will tell you. If you have a behavioral scientist, they'll say, to be honest, when you show someone through to a new waiting room, our monkey brain feels it's been upgraded, if you send people back to the old waiting room, our monkey brain feels we've been rebuffed or disregarded. 
that seems to be vitally important to understand these things. So we need to learn to talk to people who don't go to can. When I spoke about ads, and I spent quite a lot of my career doing a lot of talking about direct marketing and advertising. And duly, I got invited to advertising conferences. When I spoke about behavioral science, I suddenly found myself getting invited to Downing Street. It is a game changer in terms of both the seniority of your audience and the scope for your audience. Talking about behavioral science rather than talking about narrow Marcon's issues. Advertising doesn't have an image problem. It's got a great image. It's a great fun place to work. Lots of intelligent, highly attractive people having fun doing something that's reasonably well paid. There's not a problem there, but it's got an influence problem. Because every time there's a problem, even if that problem involves a large component of human behavior, and even if that problem involves a large, you know, has a large requirement for human behavioral insight, the economists and the lawyers get there first. This is an observation by the behavioral economist and Nobel Prize winner Richard Thaler, where he says, as a general rule, the United States government is run by lawyers who occasionally take advice from economists. Others interested in helping the lawyers out need not apply. And that is a wonderful, wonderful point, which is that it's always deep, narrow rationalists who use as their model of human behavior, neoliberal microeconomic models, which are all legal models, which are entirely driven by the need for either compulsion or the need for incentives and rewards or punishments, which is a negative incentive. If you look at the current coronavirus problem, what have our governments been able to do? They've been able to ask to what make us wash our hands. That is exclusively a behavioral problem. You can't make it a legal requirement that people wash their hands frequently because there is no means of checking what people are doing in their homes. Okay? There is no real means in which you can absolutely drive self-isolation. Or, or to put it briefly, if nobody was willing to self-isolate voluntarily, the police would be completely overwhelmed and you'd have to send out the army and the consequences would be absolutely dire. Our ability to persuade people is quite often instrumental to problems. And yet the way in which government approaches problems tends to be law first, economic second, and persuasion third. All I'm saying is, I'm not saying there isn't a role for all three, I'm saying that we should deploy them in parallel rather than in series. I'll skip this just for reasons of time. The very simple fact we also know is that what something's worth, I made this point here, um, I better go back here. Whoops, I'm going forwards and I should be going back and I apologize hugely. Um, uh, behavior has a known value, attitude doesn't. If you change someone's attitude in something, you can't say what it's worth to a company or to a government or an organization. People who need quantification, I'd argue that people hugely overestimate the need for quantification, but if people need quantification to do their jobs, behavior is a good objective, attitude simply isn't. The second thing is, in terms of value creation, um, we need to get people to understand that you can create value not by changing the objective qualities of the thing itself. That was the airport bus story I told you earlier this year. You can change the value of something by telling you a different story about it. So we try harder turns the first uh, eight lines, if I got that right. Yep, uh, eight words. So we try harder is a simple contextual tweak which changes the eight words at the top of that poster from being an ad for Hertz to being an ad for Avis. Telling people that the bus drives them all the way to passport control turns a inconvenience into a conveyance. What something is worth to a human being and therefore the incentives and motivations that it creates for them is not dependent on an objective appraisal of what the thing is, it's dependent on a subjective appraisal of what the thing means according to the context in which it's presented. And so this is where we fail. We fail to work with B2B businesses enough because they're not big advertisers. We fail to visit to work with early stage tech businesses and indeed mature tech businesses nearly as much as we could because they're not big advertisers. Government 
isn't maybe a big advertiser. So we don't work with them enough and we're only allowed to do their communications campaigns. We're not allowed to influence their wider thinking. We don't know how to work with engineers because the vocabulary we use is deeply alienating to them and with some reason. We aren't working enough with really critical organizations at the moment, like first responders, politicians, and scientists. How you present a scientific finding has as much an effect on how salient it is and how it influences behavior as what the actual finding is in mere statistical terms. And we've completely failed to work with the C-suite, not only the marketing function. So apart from that, okay, we're doing fine. And yet what we do is more important than ever, because if you look at the huge unicorn business successes of the last few years, most of them are not a product of logic. They're a problem of very, very sound marketing instinct, leading people in a completely counterintuitive direction. Amazon Prime, Dyson, Red Bull, Uber, okay? They're all psychological innovations. All of them created vast hostility from logical people at the time they were first introduced. Jeff Bezos had a massive struggle getting his colleagues to accept Amazon Prime, even though he kind of ran the company. Um, in the case of Red Bull, who on earth would launch a drink that had entirely failed in taste research, charge a high price for it and put it in a tiny can? Okay? It makes no sodding sense. Um, so we're needed more than ever because Apple, the first person who said, I don't care about what the phone can do so much as what it feels like while you're doing it. That's why Apple's worth a trillion dollars and the people who make its components who focus on rational uh, elements of value are not worth a trillion dollars, okay? And as I said, we're needed more than ever. We're the only people as marketers who see business through a consumer's eye lens, through the eye of a single agent, within a social context, operating and making decisions over time. Everybody else in the business is looking at, at customers in aggregate, on average, in a composite. It's context-free and it's creating an average view of the customer, which may indeed be a customer which doesn't really exist at all. We're the only people who are looking at a business problem through the eyes as experienced by an individual or repeat customer over time, with path dependency and context having an effect on how they react emotionally to a change or to a stimulus. Nobody else in business does this. Therefore, if you don't have a marketer in a room, you're basically missing the third dimension in your decision making. You're making decisions on a two-dimensional map with all its distortions and limitations. And at that point, I'm going to end very quickly. The value of marketing is precisely in its perspective. We are not a function. We are not a function like Marcom's. We are a unique and complementary way of looking at the world and at looking at how to solve business problems and discover new and untapped sources of value and margin creation and growth. That's what we are. Okay, we take the human perspective, not the spreadsheet perspective. If you don't have anybody else in your unit looking at the world this way, you're effectively blind to large parts of what might happen. We also, are, I would argue, start at the end. <coughs> when optimizing a customer journey, we make the advertising mistake of starting at the beginning with brand questions. No, I think if you're trying to optimize something, you start at the end. First of all, you start with obstacles to repeat purchase then obstacles to conversion, and then only when you've optimized the end of the journey should you start to optimize the beginning. So I think that's a really vital um, question to have to ask. Um, and the other thing is, as I said, this is a question, this is actually an editorial from Nature Physics. We're also unique in that we tend not to look at um, a customer base by the very, very misleading tendency of averaging it. If you see those two little charts there, there's reality and there's the, uh, you know, the average, your model assumes a level of averageness which may not simply be borne out in reality. Reality, that is, by the way, the average of, you know, that's the average of reality, that um, bell curve that you see. 
Um, and um, I'll skip I'll skip to the end, but I may make that point very clearly. We need to start at the end, not the beginning. And because we're talking about the high we're, we're talking about the high cost part of what clients do, which tends to be producing complicated communications programs, we spend too little time talking about the high added value part of the conversation, which is actually optimizing every part of the journey, even if it only requires fairly small interventions to improve things really significantly. And I think at that point, I'm going to end very quickly, except by saying this. If you aren't involved early, it's already too late. If the engineers and accountants have been discussing a problem for 10 days before anybody thinks to call marketing, uh, you've already missed your opportunity. If we're not involved early, we've missed it. That's the first point. Secondly, there's a fundamental other bias that tends to happen. Creative people have to show their work to rational people for approval. Note that this rule never applies the other way around. You never get a bunch of accountants and lawyers going, I think we've solved this problem to our rational satisfaction, but let's go and share it with some wacky people to see if they've got a better idea. Never happens, because people never like to go from a high certainty, low ambiguity environment to a low certainty, high ambiguity environment. And so anybody who enjoys pretending to be rational will tend to avoid marketing thinking like the plague, because it messes with the neatness of their very simple Newtonian model by which they judge and see the world. If you want more of this, read the book. There's a whole book about it. I have a strong hope that it will come out in Romanian at some point. Uh, I'm fairly sure there's an arrangement with a Romanian publisher. And um, double check, um, I'd be very, very pleased if it did. That would, nothing would make me happier. Um, and if you've got follow-up questions, by all means ask questions now, because I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to open up for questions over chat or possibly face-to-face, -face, depending on how the hosts wish to play it. But thank you all for turning up. If you are too shy uh, to ask a question or you only think of a question tomorrow or next week or whatever, and there's anything you want to know, my two the Twitter addresses on which to reach us and I hope follow us are at Rory Sutherland and at Ogilvy Consulting. And that is within the sort of 50-minute uh, 50, 50 framework. Uh, that's as much as I have time for. It is recorded. So again, if you want to share the recording, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm entirely happy for that to happen. But now I'm just going to stop sharing. I'm going to reveal my face to the world again. And I'm open for questions. Thank you very much indeed. Rory, huge, huge thanks. Uh, I would like to kindly ask everyone to put the video on so that we feel more like face to face. And uh, let's uh, start uh, bringing the questions on. We still have Rory for a few minutes, so uh, let's get the inspiration flowing. I have a question, if I may. Of course. My question, Rory, to you is, First of all, congratulations. It's always a pleasure, a, a delight to listen to you talk. Uh, and uh, no matter how much I read or I listen to you, I always make uh, huge notes. But my very uh, clear question is, so we are facing a crisis, eco well, health, but also economic crisis, that might uh, change a little bit the way we look at things and the way we do things. In this industry where we are not a function, and here I agree with you, we are definitely part of the strategic and should be part of the strategic conversation. What do you think should be our steps? How, how would that or will this crisis reorganize us somehow? In your mind, of course, nobody can predict, but in your view. So the only mention I made to that was one of the things I do think is that the widespread adoption of Zoom uh, will change the way we work with clients and organizations and will change the way people travel to work. It will change the amount of time they spend at work. That in turn may have effect on the property market because living centrally may lose some of its appeal if you only work uh, three or four days a week. Um, uh, I also think it has, an, but that was, that was merely an aside. Um, I think that most, most of the really uh, useful behavioral science work will actually be applied not in not at the moment where the message is fairly simple you stay home you wash your hands I would also add wear a mask but for some reason uh, well, I don't understand 
it, it is not for me to dictate to health professionals. Okay, I don't understand why we're not encouraged to use masks, but nonetheless, it's not my job to dictate to health professionals because my job as a behavioral person is for health professionals to tell me what behavior they want to see and me to tell them how that might be best achievable. Okay, it's not to reverse the order where I go and say, Hey, why don't we do this? Okay, now at the moment, you know, wash your hands, uh, keep a healthy distance from everybody else. Stay indoors when you possibly can. Um, and um, uh, 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 again, uh, you know, practice. Uh, someone actually did make the very good point that it should have been called physical distancing, not social distancing, because social distancing gives it the wrong frame, which I think is a, that was Nicholas Christakis, I think, uh, who, who is a social scientist who made that observation, that physical distancing is a better descriptor, but it's too late because the dog, you know, the horse had bolted by that point. Okay, um, when it comes to um, gradually releasing the lockdown in a way that makes possible um, tracing and measurement, uh, I think behavioral science will be more important uh, than it is at present. Uh, in that, you know, I'm debating suggesting things. All I can do is suggest things to virologists and say, here's a system that would work behaviorally, but does it work from a virological standpoint? Because if it doesn't, don't do it. I'm not, you know, uh, you know, I know my, you know, I'm not even a famous scientist, for God's sake, I'm a classicist. So I know my status within the, um, you know, the pecking order. I also talk to people like Nassim Taleb regularly, who are really, really good experts on risk, because they understand things about how you deal with imperfect information in a way that scientists don't. Scientists aren't really good at imperfect information, because the, 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 the tendency of a science is you create artificially perfect information that works with a model, and then you solve for the model. That's fine if the information is sufficient to create a fairly robust model. To be honest, most of us are working uh, um, in a state of ignorance, and we don't even know whether all the, uh, the information we were given early on is true. But when it comes to gradual lockdown, I would be suggesting things like, you have to carry a letter addressed to you. If your postcode, bear in mind Britain and Canada have weird, we don't have a number like America, like a zip code. We have my, my own postcode, which I will share with you is TN161JE. Yeah. You might say that in three Wednesdays time, people whose postcode ends in an E are allowed to go out. Maybe it's people whose postcodes end in an E and a J, so they're quite far apart. But you would allow small identifiable pockets of people to go out uh, they would justify their traveling by simply showing you a utility bill that's addressed to them. If anybody's screamingly desperate to go out, they could always forge a utility bill. But, um, but, but uh, you know, I think we can safely say it's a minority of people who are going to do that. And that might be, depending on who I talk to, and I would talk to a broad range of experts, by the way, not just virologists. I'd talk to, you know, pragmatic doctors. I'd talk to experts in risk and uncertainty okay um one of the one of the things i do is I'd, I'd i'd be saying look it's there's no point in designing for behaviors using epidemiological models that individuals find impossible to follow we need some heuristic rules um we've currently been involved in some work which says don't tell people to keep two meters apart tell them to keep more than the length of a bed apart because the length of a bed is something that springs to mind more readily than a simple numerical distance. So that, that has lots and lots of implications, which is where you have uh, work done by uh, behavioral scientists working with other experts to say, again, what they want, they may want something that's perfect. If what's perfect is behaviorally impossible, we have to arrive at some sort of compromise. Thank you. Rory, if your time still allows, we have a few questions that... Uh, of course, on chat. Like that. Yeah, yes, I'll open yes. that up now. Um, it's what are the opportunities quite optimistic see? community here, so uh, <laughs> it's good to see the uh, good, the, the positive, let's say, turn of the, of the current crisis. So. Well, how, how is Bucharest affected um, uh, compared to the rest of, of Romania? I haven't been looking at those detailed statistics. 
Apparently, from the statistics they share, it's affected, but not the mo obviously it's the biggest, the largest city, but uh, compared to its population, it's not the most affected region uh, at all. In which case, I, I hope to say that that's actually quite an optimistic piece of news, by which I do not mean optimistic uh, in, um, uh, in the sense that you should now relax, but in oh. terms of containment, what we typically see is large metropolitan areas. There are exceptions, there are, ex there are outliers, but large metropolitan areas, simply because of the degree in which people unavoidably come into close contact with large numbers of strangers for protracted periods of time, seem to suffer worse. And so from a point of view of containment and recovery, I think that probably is, is rather good news. Yeah. Because um, even if you look at the United States, you see New York very, very. New York, New York is, is an outlier as a city in the US in terms of its architecture mm. and in terms of its transportation systems. Nassim Taleb's currently in Atlanta and he says, you know, one thing that Atlanta has to be thankful for is it has no public transportation. So, um, it's a slightly, slightly ironic and uh, not very environmentally friendly message, but it's nonetheless true. Yeah. Um, I've got a question at the top. Um, yeah, there are oh, a few questions for you. So, yeah. one is from Alexandru. How should we frame this context in order to make something good from it? Yes, um, I think there's something very important. And I, what I'll do to answer that question quickly is I've written an article in Campaign exactly about this, and I will tweet it out. What I've said is it's very, very rare for the world to all stop doing something simultaneously. OK, the world doesn't go on holiday simultaneously. When I was a kid, industrial towns used to close the factory for two weeks and everybody in the town would go on holiday at the same time. At Christmas, this happens in Western Europe. People take a week off and they all come back refreshed. And that simultaneous break provides people with an opportunity to reinvent their behavior collectively. Hmm. Because a lot of our behavior is determined by the behavior of other people around us. And therefore, there are a lot of destructive, competitive behaviours present in the world, I think. And this is a lifetime opportunity to start asking ourselves, has the volume of travel, for example, of air travel, grown simply too fast? Has this become ridiculous? Is this something which is a gift that we're treating like a right? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, in business... One of the things I'll be doing when I go back is I will be very simply asking the question, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, can we make it a norm that when someone holds a meeting, particularly an international meeting, there is always a video co conferencing alternative by default so that those people who wish not to fly don't feel they're missing out because they're not willing to get on a plane. Yes. Okay, so 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 it's an opportunity. So I, I, one of the important things about Zoom, by the way, is that now everybody's at least reasonably good at it. Now, what used to be the problem with Zoom is that the worst two people on the call who messed up the technology kind of ruined the call for everybody else. And so the efficacy and role of things of technologies like this, I did funnily enough have a section in my talk, which I didn't have time for, which was exactly about this kind of thing. But in terms of where our, what our status currencies are, what we care about, who we care about, our balance of local and international. And I don't think, by the way, local and international is a contradiction. Many people see it as a very simple contradiction, but I think it's perfectly possible to live locally in your body and live internationally in your mind okay um you know so i i i see actually localism and globalism as act, is in a strange way as vectors there you know we will both become more local and we will become more global at the same time but this is an opportunity because it's effectively just as it's good to reboot your computer every few weeks because if you leave it switched on bad processes start building up it's, and it's a good idea to turn your mobile phone off every now and then, because if you don't do a restart or a reboot, bad processes become embedded. In the same way, stopping world capitalism for, let's hope, is, you know, uh, you know a reasonably manageable length of time is, is also a good thing. Because, it's, again, it might kill some of the worst processes, the worst excesses 
that uh, both industries, institutions and people have actually built up with over the last few years. So I hope that answers two, yeah, two questions. Um, and, and also, I think, it, um, I think it's, by the way, there's a huge opportunity. Um, uh, and I would, um, uh, I, I've, I've just been talking to people this morning about this, uh, in business television. When I talk about Zoom, I use Zoom as a shorthand. What I mean is that, uh, you know, uh, if, if anybody here is, is thinking of starting a business now, if you start a business in the broadcast of conferences and the digitization of the conference world, uh, you're probably in a fairly safe business space uh, if, that, if you make that your area of expertise. Because I can see leisure travel resuming faster than the business conference market. And so the opportunity to create B2B TV is something, if you look at, you know, here in the UK, you get Bloomberg, you get MSNBC. It's not about business, it's about sodding finance. It's not about markets and the proper definition of markets, it's about the financial markets, okay? That's not business, that's finance. No one's yet created a really good business TV channel. And one of the opportunities I see uh, is the opportunity to create entirely new forms of content. Most of us might have noticed that um, although we're notionally practicing social distancing, in some respects, the, the last few weeks have been more social than five months ago. One, I met, meet up with all my team once a day on Zoom and we all have a chat, okay? Um, and um, uh, then um, uh, we don't always do that physically because you can't get a meeting room. And so we have a kind of conversation which didn't exist before. But also, on a personal level, I'm in contact with friends now every, well, twice a week, who live in Canada or live in Spain or just, just live in London, to be honest. I live just outside London, who under normal circumstances I'd only see every few months. And in many ways, my social life has been recalibrated and rebalanced by what is supposedly social distancing. Yes. And for our industry, Rory, that's a question from Felix for our marketing or for, let's say, the advertising industry. Do you see there is an opportunity for us moving forward? Uh, yes, uh, we have to. We have to. We, we, we have a service. We have a duty to ourselves. We have a duty to our staff. We also have a duty to our clients and no one's disputing that. And but in advising our clients, we have to be sensitive to the possibility for creating a new kind of dialogue with consumers as well, because we do have a duty to our audiences uh, as well as uh, a duty to our clients, by the way, mm -hmm. and a duty to our staff. And if we fail to actually, if we go to our clients and say, don't worry guys, it's just business as usual, you know, let's have a sale. I think we failed in providing or helping catalyze Behavioural changes in consumers, which many people may actually very much want. Yeah. You know, I think people want the world to work differently. I think people have become frustrated by the fact that the world is monotonic. It's obsessed with efficiency, with scale, uh, with, you know, with a very narrow conception of profit and efficiency. And I think the people want to live in a more nuanced world. Even business people want to live in a world where we judge things uh, by slightly more subjective measures than we did before. Yeah. And I think if we don't challenge people to think that way, uh, then we're failing everybody we have a responsibility to. We were um, talking a few weeks ago uh, within a similar format that the two, 2008 crisis uh, was a crisis by which the advertising industry was in a way put in a corner and um, in the boardroom you know you are getting uh, bills procurement and performance media but maybe this current crisis is an opportunity for our industry to take back to the boardroom insights and creativity at the core of the business model yes I, I absolutely agree that certainly, uh, certainly at the very least, you could own the word human. Yes. OK, if there's one word you want to own, it's human, because you say this isn't, you know, this should have 
you know, this should have put an absolute pay. The fact that without requiring a financial incentive, first responders have gone out and put themselves at considerable risk without demanding financial incentives or compulsion to do so out of their own sense of professionalism and duty to their own colleagues. Yes. Okay. If you, if you fail to notice that during this crisis, then you're blind. And therefore, if you try and go back to business as usual, which is simply dealing with people as if they're, you know, resources, you know, as if they're numbers on a spreadsheet to be paid the minimum wage, to be treated as essentially, you know, something which has a value in proportion to the hours of work it puts in. Remember, you should know this being Romanian, right? Pay, the idea of time of labor based value creation is Marxist. Mm. It's extraordinary that businesses are looking at labor costs, uh, you know, and the value of an employee being somehow proportionate to hours spent in a way that Marx would have found completely acceptable. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I mean, from an economic standpoint, it is completely weird that, conve weird that conventional economics is happy to adopt a Marxist theory um, about value. And the point is that if you own the word human, it's a very simple thing. When people say, what sort of problems can you solve? I answer it very simply. We're not planning to get into watch repair. We're not planning to get into bridge building. Okay. If you can define success by objective means, there are far better people than us to solve your problems. If, on the other hand, part of your solution requires humans to perceive or, sub to, to perceive or act in a different way, then there's a role for us. Mm. We can't guarantee you pure certainty, but we can't guarantee perfect answers. We can guarantee you better questions. Now, someone has asked the ethical question here. Um, you know, if we focus uh, too much on the emotional insight, is there a risk of manipulation? I think that the honest truth I have to say is whatever context you provide for a decision manipulates that decision. OK, so am I manipulating my dad? I'll give you two very simple examples. My father wouldn't buy Sky Television, multi-channel TV over satellite. And I knew fairly well, having known my dad, that my dad would actually like Sky very much. He's not interested in sport, not interested in movies, but he loves factual television. Something like the Smithsonian Channel or PBS is a source of immense delight. And I tried to persuade him to get it. I even offered, and this is the economic solution, to pay for him to have Sky. And he said, no, no, it's too much money. It's £17 a month. And I said, well, it's not £17 a month, is it? It's 60p a day. And he said, well, that doesn't make any difference. 60p a day is kind of £18 a month. Okay? Why does that make a difference? I said, well, you spend £2 a day on newspapers. So if you spend £2 a day on newspapers, it's not that crazy paying 60p a day to have not only 200 channels of television, a factual television, but also the facility to pause that television and record it remotely so you can watch more of the good stuff and less of the rubbish. And he said, I see what you mean. That makes perfect sense. He then went, got it himself, and is a huge advocate going around to all his friends, he's 89, um, going around all his friends and saying, you really must get Sky. It's marvellous. <laughs> now, at one level, by changing the frame, I manipulated my dad. At the second level, because, he's, it, it, because it's a decision where, let's face it, had he hated it, he could have backed out. Okay? You know, uh, I don't, you know, you, you can cancel your contract if you're not happy. There are legal terms around this. It's fair to say that the downside risk was low and the upside opportunity was high. Um, thirdly, um, since, he, since it's actually encouraged him to do something that he was reluctant to do, which subsequent events have proved was a good decision, what we were really doing was we weren't, by changing the context in which he chose, we weren't really, well, we changed what he, we, what, he, um, uh, uh, what he chose, decided to do, but we did so not really by manipulation, but by changing his solution set, by changing the way he saw the price. Now, every decision we make, I think, is contingent on how we see it. And yes, I agree that advertising could manipulate people into buying things they don't want. The extent to which we need to be ethically nervous depends on how reversible the decision is in many cases. And I can see people cheating people into long-term investments or pension products where you only learn you've made a bad decision when it's too late.
and I generally support a, you know, a reasonable amount of legislation in those areas. But equally, if you try a new shampoo, you know, the, you know, the downside risk is relatively small, the upside benefit could be very large. Mm. The final thing to say is that organisations always choose law first, government law first, economic second, persuasion third. I would argue that um, you should, at the very least, reverse that order or consider all three in parallel. Um, but you certainly shouldn't start with compulsion before you've even tried persuasion. Yes. Selective libertarianism. <laughs> I'd also argue, by the way, that I'm interested in a school of, uh, of law which legislates in order to give people more choice. So legislation, which, for example, said, um, and uh, there's a colleague, of, a friend of mine called Helen Wakeley, who's an MP in the UK. She's legislating so that when you run an advertisement for a job, any advertisement for a job, unless you state to the contrary, it will be assumed that the job offers some degree of flexible working. And the reason she's doing that is just to change the norm. So companies have to say, if we, if we say this doesn't offer flexible working, it was designed interestingly for working mothers, like a lot of good ideas. Um, it actually started appealing just as much to a large number of men who said, I'd much rather, you know, I want to, you know, I want to spend half a day a week with my grandkids, whatever it may be. I'd much rather work flexibly and indeed would work for less money in order to do so. But, but what that's doing is it's legislating to give people more choice because the default is you have a choice rather than the default being unless we tell you otherwise you will be expected to turn up at eight o'clock in the morning and you will be uh, you know under the gaze of your employer for the following nine hours and that that is what i call libertarian legislation which sounds like a contradiction in terms but it isn't rory i think uh, we are definitely you know um we have used more of your time that, uh, than we talked at the beginning and uh, a lot of your inspiration. I think if we've learned something, it's absolutely that we need to balance the human presence and the spreadsheet presence in the, in the boardroom and that we as a marketing community, we need to bring back the insights, the creativity and uh, the voice of the human in our businesses and in our daily experiences. Why not? Uh, we do have, you know, on uh, television, all the is breaking news, negative news, and so on. But I believe that the past uh, one hour and uh, almost a half that we spent together, at least for me, it brought a lot of uh, ideas. It brought a lot of, uh, you know, smile and uh, uh, a very, very good energy. And I would personally like to thank you big time for this one. I it's a pleasure to do that. It's one of the most important things we can be doing. Humans th thrive on kind of reciprocated attention. And if you can use technology, uh, just, just to, you know, make sure that everybody you know isn't, uh, you know, feeling neglected. Uh, that's probably the first duty of the working day. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And I think the other, so the, other, the other idea I'm absolutely taking is that uh, the opportunity of having all humankind simultaneously a vacation. Yeah. It's once in a lifetime. It's and once in a lifetime. <laughs> absolutely right. Mm. My take today was uh, on, the, on the word human. My take today is go after smaller B2B management consultancy. Yeah, there, there are so many. The, uh, 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 and for smaller agencies or agencies in you know, smaller markets, which tend to report to a regional hub, uh, the opportunity you have in behavioral... You know, the advertising may be determined in Chicago or may be determined in Vienna or wherever it is, okay? But the behavioral science, you can practice locally. In fact, you, you will need to test it locally first anyway. So the very fact that you're a local office is as much an advantage as it is a weakness. Yes. Yes. I agree. Well, it was... a. Uh... It was the best uh, hour and a half of my previous two weeks, I'm telling you. <laughs> well, my big hope is I'll be back in Bucharest before the end of the year. Um, yes. It was my first visit this last time, and I was captivated by the city and by the people. And my first instinct on heading for the airport to go home was, I've got to bring my wife and children back here. 
Oh, definitely. It, it, it's the thinking man's Paris. It's wonderful. Yes. When you come, <laughs> make sure that you give us a call and we'll make it a wonderful schedule for you and your family. You will love it. That would be perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Not distancing, but still connected. Exactly. Still connected. It's physical distancing, not social distancing. Stay yes. safe, everybody. And um, if anybody knows anybody who's ill, get well soon. And thank you so much. Thank you, Roy. Thank you so, so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. So, uh, cine mai dorește să mai rămână un pic așa, la un pic de debriefing, un pic de debate, să construim pe ceea ce a spus uh, Rory? Am schimbat pe română pentru că am văzut că suntem doar vorbitori de limbă română. Înainte de, de a face debrief, eu vreau să-ți mai spun uh, uh, câteva mari mulțumiri. În primul rând, Dianei și lui Victor, care sunt arhitecții din spatele sesiunii de astăzi. Diana și Victor, practic, l-au adus pe Rory astă toamnă și l-au adus din nou astăzi. Mulțumiri! Și mai au multe, multe surprize frumoase, o să șeruim imediat câteva. Și apoi mai vreau să mai spun mulțumiri lui Alexandru, pe care nu l-ați auzit, dar este acolo pe ecranul meu undeva în colțul din dreapta sus, care s-a ocupat de toată partea tehnică în așa fel încât cu toții să-l auzim pe Rory bine, să-l vedem bine, să înregistrăm și așa mai departe. Alexandru, poate vrei să ne faci cu mâna? Eu vă mulțumesc că sunteți aici. E lucru foarte mare că m-am fost alături eu în vremea asta de... vremea asta frumoasă. Da. <laughs> și aș mai vrea să-i mai mulțumesc Bianca. Fiecare dintre voi a primit astăzi detaliile de conectare prin tastatura și mâinile Bianca. Și acum aș vrea să vă propun să ne spuneți așa, sau să ne spunem între noi care ne sunt key takeaway urile pe care le-am luat din, din discuția asta spumoasă și frumoasă cu Rory. Eu mi-am făcut două pagini și jumătate de notițe, că sunt așa old school, mi-au notițe cu pixul. <laughs> Mi-a dat și idee de business, adică, wow! Deci, de ideea de final, nici dacă îl întrebam mai bine de digital, digitalizarea conferinței, mi se pare o idee pe cât de bună, pe atât de utilă și cred că în urma acestei crize sau acestei situații pe care o trăim, lumea o să fie mult mai atentă și precaută la a se duce în adunări mari de oameni. Mă gândeam eu așa, îmi place foarte mult Black IP și mă gândeam înainte să pornească ce mi-ar fi plăcut să mă duc la Neversi, deși restul line-up-ului nu-i pentru mine și, în general, urăsc marile adunări atât de mari. Acum, chiar dacă ar fi fost într-un context, dar acum, în contextul ăsta, chiar dacă s-ar da unde verde, nu m-aș duce. Nu m-aș duce dintr-o precauție. Și atunci, cred că asta va fi o, o, o zonă umană normală. Să evit, poate, grupuri mai mici, da, dar multă lume la un loc e totuși riscant, știi? Uh, și atunci, cred că orice fel de idee care vine în uh, întâmpinarea reducerii numărului de oameni, dar cu toate astea acces la uh, conținut de calitate, cred că va fi, e binevenit. Asta e părerea mea. Eu să știți că mi-am notat pentru... Pentru business nostru, pentru Curizer, mi-am notat cu multe semne de exclamare chestia asta cu excitement attributes. attributes. Da, le utilizam și înainte, le spuneam delight factors uh, și da, cu siguranță o să mă gândesc, o să ne gândim și o să încercăm să simțim care ar putea să fie acele uh, excitement exact. attributes care pot să fie aduse în experiențele de învățare în așa fel încât învățarea să nu mai fie un efort, ci să fie o experiență de delight și de excitement. Da. E un, un takeaway pe care mi l-am luat eu. Un alt lucru important e cu Marcom ăsta și cred că ar trebui să-l reinventăm. Hai să uităm de Marcom. Adică, într-adevăr, pare atât de funcțional și, cum spunea, we are not a function. Dacă durează mai mult de luna mai, uităm sigur. Iertați-mi optimismul.
Uite, eu aș vrea să... Adina, cred că tu încerci să spui ceva, dar ori ești pe mute, ori să știi că nu te auzim. E posibil să nu fi dat join audio din colțul de stânga jos. Eu am relaționat foarte mult cu ceea ce a spus Rory în urmă cu vreo, nu știu, aproape 20 de ani. Esența jobului meu în marketing, în P&G, era să unveil deep consumer insights, spuneam. Și știu că petreceam 3-4 luni până găseam un insight atât de profund încât puteam să, să construim ani de zile un brand pornind de la acel insight. Că era o, o muncă extraordinar de plăcută și super, super rewarding. Adina, nu știu dacă la tine s-a redresat problema. Nu te -am, încă nu te auzim. Da, mă dă. Și pentru mine a fost o experiență foarte frumoasă, mai ales că în sine conferințele în domeniul advertising-ului nu, nu sunt nici ușor de găsit și în general este foarte greu să mergem la ele. În plus, desigur... Rory este, o, așa cum spunea Diana mai devreme, e o mare bucurie. Uh, și chiar uh, și mie mi-a trezit câteva rotițe așa de mode, adică o parte între întrebări, ce umblau și mie în minte. Da, Victor, îți înțeleg uh, cumva, să nu zicem optimi, uh, pardon, uh, negativismul. <laughs> Și pe mine mă cam macină chestia asta, dar cred că e și un timp de reflexie, așa cumva. Eu mi-am propus ca în fiecare zi să-mi notez chestii pe care le remarc, iar după discuția de azi am mai sesizat niște lucruri pe care nu le văzusem. Și niște întrebări. Pentru, pentru noi e o oportunitate, adică, nu știu, pentru mine este o oportunitate. Se mai află și colegi de ai mei care s-au logat, deci cred că nu e doar părerea mea. Și sunt sigură că mai sunt și alții din academic aici. Deci cred că, chiar dacă poate nu-i vorba doar de publicitate, ci de mai mult. Mă da, ne, ne poți șerui așa un, un gând pe care ți l-ai notat și pe care, să spunem, că nu l-aveai neapărat top of your mind înainte și acum a devenit, a urcat undeva acolo? Um, da, m-am întrebat, de exemplu, în timpul crizei acestea, am luat legătura și cu oameni din agenții și așa ce se întâmplă, de exemplu, da, m-am întrebat ce fac, ce se întâmplă, cum se schimbă viața lor acum, cum se schimbă activitatea. Și cumva mi-a plăcut răspunsul, răspunsul lui Rory, care a spus trebuie să avem grijă de clienți, trebuie să avem grijă de... Da? Și am văzut în spate ideea că se cam reconfigurează unele lucruri, da? se reconfigurează poate și modul de abordare. De asemenea, m-a mai plăcut, mă rog, foarte tare modul în care a vorbit despre poziționarea asta extrem de relevantă, o normă marcată de durată, o normă marcată de... Da, de Uh, exemplu cu pizza mi-a plăcut foarte mult, trebuie să recunosc, da, că mi-am notat multe. Și faptul că în sine, mă rog, comportamentele noastre au o valoare știută și că atitudinile nu neapărat. Deci diferența dintre fapte și atitudini, facts and attitude, din punctul meu de vedere. Mă rog, ar fi multe lucruri. Am o mulțime de lucruri pe care mi le dar mi s-au părut toate extrem de... Da. În prima etapă nici nu puteam lua notițe pe care am Da, exact. Da, asta spun. În prima etapă mi-am răsat și aș mai participa. <laughs> Trebuie încărtată. Mai facem. Da, da. Laura. Laura, mi s-a părut că ai făcut un semn. Eu nu știu da. dacă eu mă aud. Îi făceam la revedere, Cristine Sfico, care v-a spus că este. A, care pleacă. Tocmai vrea să o întreb cum i s-a părut. Cristina a plecat de la, nu? Să vă spun și eu două highlight-uri pe care le-am reținut, că de fiecare dată Rory e așa un izvor fantastic de, de knowledge și insights. Este în momentul ăsta cam cel mai valoros om pentru ce înseamnă insight. Mm -hmm. Și fix pentru insight finding, cred că e extraordinar lucrul ăsta pe care l-a spus, că întotdeauna trebuie să ne uităm la ce consideră oamenii că merită, mm -hmm. care e un unghi excelent mm -hmm. în a diferenția un adevăr de un insight. Um, asta e bun pentru toată lumea și pentru cei care inventează produse și pentru cei care uh, creează comunicare și pentru cei care, până la urmă, pentru cei care fac teaching, <laughs> nu mă dau întotdeauna. O să fie valoros. Um, un alt lucru care mi s-a părut foarte bun și mulțumesc cu i-a pus întrebarea cu manipularea. 
pentru că este un subiect nemuritor, mai ales cu elevii uh, sau cu um, studenții pe care îi mentorăm nu? sau îi tutorăm în diverse uh, funcțiuni pe care le avem destul de mulți uh, din, uh, din IA și nu numai. Um, și mi s-a părut foarte, foarte bun acest, acest mod de a privi lucrurile în care trebuie să le explicăm Um, oamenilor că e vorba de o schimbare, un, un changing the frame pentru om și nu neapărat o manipulare. Până la urmă decizia aia lor, dacă fac cumpărarea sau nu. Important e cum le explicăm ce înseamnă produsul ăla. Cum le arătăm că produsul ăla uh, poate li se potrivește. Uh, și mi se pare foarte bună uh, treaba asta, mai ales pentru că sunt un... Uh, foarte mare fan al liberului arbitru și al respectării liberului arbitru. Sunt foarte mar, mare fan al uh, advertising etic și trebuie să recunoaștem că foarte puțin uh, tineri intră în industrie în perioada asta pentru că uh, nu, nu simt etică foarte multă de la noi și ar trebui să fim foarte atenți la asta, tot comunicatorii. Um, și da, până la urmă, îi, îi, cred că trebuie să îi învățăm pe studenții noștri și pe toți cei tineri din jurul nostru ce înseamnă de fapt manipulare. Știu că e un termen care e foarte shiny așa, și e foarte interesant să-l arunci într-o discuție și probabil asta îi face să, să-l arunci cu, cu foarte mare patos. Um, și mi s-a părut foarte bună explicația lui, chiar e un lucru. Adică schimbarea de perspectivă și persuasion ăsta, care înseamnă cumva convingere, seducție în sfârșit, adică nu te forțezi, dar îți dau și argumente care să-ți schimbe un pic până la urmă, cum spunea, poți să ieși din orice fel de contract, din orice fel de nu-ți place, a ieșit și dacă demigiu, nu crezi un demigi profund, e la alegerea omului, dar măcar încercarea. Da, e, mi-a plăcut, îmi place întotdeauna, sunt un fan pe viață, deci e clar. Eu aș vrea să mai adaug o idee pe zona asta cu manipularea și care a fost vizibilă și în exemplul cu tatălui Rory. Cred că dacă, după ce face acest reframing în așa fel încât omul ia decizia până la urmă independent, îi creezi omului, tatălui, consumatorului, publicului țintă și așa mai departe, un sentiment de mulțumire și de bucurie. Curie, cred că este bă, bă, good reframing. Dacă la final omul respectiv se simte trapped, se simte păcălit, da. se simte exact. exploatat, atunci este un, un reframing îndoielnic. Manipulator. Da. Corect. Nu știu dacă eu mă aud. Da. Acum mă aud? Da. Da, da. Mie mi s-a părut foarte puternică observația asta apropo de socializare. Că, de fapt, nu socializezi mai puțin în perioada asta, ci că physical distance este, într-adevăr, nu există, da? Sau e foarte mare. Dar, de fapt, uite cum a dat exemplu cu meeting room-urile, că nu, sunt, nu erau meeting room și, de fapt, ajuns să stai în același birou cu oameni, să nu au nu a ajuns să ai o conexiune reală sau să ai totul pe fugă și așa. Și mi se pare foarte puternic și, apropo de întrebarea pe care ai pus-o tu, Diana, și ce pusesem eu, dar n-am mai apucat, mi se pare un insight bun pentru viitor, când ne vom întoarce la normalitate sau, mă rog, la noua normalitate, că nu va mai fi la fel, Asta va fi ceva ce va rămâne, adică va fi, oamenii acum vor fi mai, vor utiliza mult mai ușor instrumentele, cum a zis și zoom acum nu mai e o problemă, o barieră tehnică și atunci vom folosi mult mai mult instrumentele astea. Și cred că și pentru ownerii de business va fi un insight bun ăsta că, băi, se poate face. Până acum unii au adoptat ideea asta de remote work, unii s-au temut foarte mult, am văzut o grămadă de studii, dacă e bun, dacă e mai eficient, dacă nu e mai eficient, dar acum cred că a fost un mai bun test. Da, păi și da. cred că mulți vor lua decizii în zona asta. A fost bun test apropo de ideea asta. Toată lumea în același timp face lucrul ăsta forțat. Testăm work from home. Da, 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 da. da. Testăm uh, Zoom și baking bread, nu? Da. E, da. Ce mi se pare de socializarea asta forțată pe net, mă rog, digitală și de distanțare fizică. 
Mie mi se pare, poate doar părerea mea, că deodată conexiunile sociale nu mai sunt atât de multe, într-adevăr, dar nici nu mai sunt atât de superficiale. Da, care părere. rămân, sunt mult mai profunde, adânci, valoroase, adevărate, te conectezi și uman cumva, mă, cum îți e? Lucru pe care niciodată nu l-am fi întrebat înainte. Gândiți-vă puțin, ne întâlneam, ce faci, te-ai dus la teatru, te-ai dus la ok, ba, hai să trecem la treabă. Acum, acum îți e, te simți bine psihic, fizic, adică simplu fapt că avem această grijă cumva și pentru celălalt și pentru noi, evident, cred că ne unește puțin mai mult, mai, mai profund. Și au, s-au eliminat toată... toată era un, un nor așa de nenumărate contacte sociale care poate că nu erau cele mai relevante, știu eu. Da, într-un fel s-a făcut liniște și s-a făcut spațiu, știi? Spațiu pentru... Da. Ok, ai această întâlnire de o oră, fă o, o, ești numai în întâlnirea aia, parcă da. ești mult mai în prezent, așa mi se pare. Da. Da. Da, și asta mi se pare, deci asta cred că va fi o schimbare, asta mi-a rămas așa că va fi o schimbare uh, importantă și asta cu mulțimile, într-adevăr, va fi mult timp până și ne vom relua uh, comportamentul ăsta de uh, a sta în mulțimi foarte mari. Da, clar. Da. Mă rog, poate tinerii mai puțin, da, oricum. Da, da. Eu da. aș vrea să mai invit uh, opinii și notițe așa în, în mini-sesiunea da. asta de sharing. O să vă zic și eu un gând. Uh, eu cred că, dincolo de toate lucrurile bune și pozitive pe care le putem lua după discuția asta, cred că mai sunt și câteva lucruri care trebuie să ne pună la treabă. Uh, cred că omul ăsta fabulos uh, ne-a și bătut puțin obrazul. Cred că partea asta de comunicare, de marketing, de branding a ajuns să fie atât de neimportant în companii din cauza noastră, a, a, în cauza unor de, de marketing, de comunicare, de branding. Cred că trebuie să facem mai mult și cred că după ce am, am primit acest mindset foarte diferit de cel pe care îl putem explora în țara asta, ar trebui să mergem fiecare acasă, să ne mai gândim puțin, să vedem ce am greșit, ce greșim și ce putem să facem mai mult. Vă zic și un exemplu foarte actual. Printre altele, adică că dincolo de Curizer, se întâmplă ca aici, în satul unde mă aflu, să am și o mică agenție de branding și design. De vreo trei săptămâni discutăm cu un client destul de mare care vrea să facă rebranding. Și nu acceptă în niciun fel niște lucruri de bază referitor la rebranding. Adică nu au nevoie de specialist, cumva știu să facă lucrurile in-house. Uh-huh. Am plecat foarte de jos în comunicarea cu ei. Credem că clienții noștri au nevoie de mai mult de la noi. Cred că au nevoie de uh, o credere în sine, a noastră, pe care să o comunicăm în fiecare discuție pe care o avem cu ei. Trebuie să avem acel focus pe plus valoare și să poate, mai ales acum, în perioada asta grea, să uităm de bugete sau să le dăm puțin mai, mai în spate și să căutăm să câștigăm împreună. Eu cu asta plec, plec azi, din, din discuția de azi și ei sunt foarte recunoscător acestui om că mi-a mai dat puțină încredere. Că uneori simt că sunt singur pe drumul ăsta al drumul ăsta al uh, ideii de a fi aproape de clienții potențiali, de a ajuta cu adevărat. Nu e singur, Alexandru, dar nu toți clienții sunt cum sp- adică ar trebui, dar nu sunt toți și poate este un wake-up call și pentru ei. Adică cumva cred că reframing-ul și la client nu neapărat spus așa. Ar trebui să fie, băi, tu știi atât de bine în business-ul tău, ce ai tu de făcut, nu știu, că faci cuie, că faci pantofi, ce îi face tu? Eu știu altă treabă și exact ce spunea și el. Sigur că responsabilitatea este față de clienți, responsabilitatea este față de consumatori. Și noi, a zis, we're needed more than ever, pentru că aducem perspectiva consumatorului. Asta este de bază până la urmă și asta trebuie să fie poziționarea noastră ca oameni de marketing sau advertising, branding și așa mai departe, Uh, și și uh, modul în care să-i convingem, cred. 
dar uh, ai, te empatizez cu tine, știu prin ce treci. Da. Să transformăm pe din cauză uh, în datorită, datorită. Pentru, pentru oamenii care aduc omul înapoi în companie. Da. Manuela, vrei să ne spui mai mult? Văd, văd gândul tău aici în chat și cred că e foarte, foarte important. Bună ziua tuturor și mulțumesc pentru oportunitatea deosebită. O vă mărturisesc mai în glumă, mai în serios, că aproape aș vrea să vă invit pe toți la cursul pe care îl țin studenților de studii de piață. <laughs> cursul care am încercat să le vorbesc de a ieși din cantitativ acesta în care ei sunt adesea blocați și de a încerca metode de marketing inteligent. Le-am vorbit chiar recent de marketing emoțional, le-am mai încercat un Gladwell. Mi-aș fi dorit să am un vorbitor cum, cum a fost cel pe care l-am avut astăzi și pe voi alături. Dar revenind un pic la subiect, dar am reținut aspectele care deja s-au spus și nu, nu m-aș referi din nou la ele. Foarte interesantă prezentarea, ne dă de gândit și în plan uman, și în planul afacerilor, dar de asemenea în planul etic. Mi se pare că acest semnal cumva unește toate punctele de vedere și ne întoarce la valorile de bază. Aici nu mă gândesc numai la o perspectivă didactică, este din pălăria aceasta de didactică, ci ca om, om de presă, Uh, și, uh, de asemenea, uh, mi se pare că, uh, totuși, sau temerea mea este că vom uita repede. Nu știu cât va dura pandemia, poate că, într-adevăr, uh, uh, vor fi niște comportamente care se vor modifica și această prudență, pentru o perioadă de timp, poate vom încerca să ne modificăm, efectiv, comportamentul, nu știu, și să, să creăm această distanțare fizică foarte interesant concept uh, și peste mai mult timp, dar, de obicei, omul uită, omul uită foarte repede din ceea ce trece. Și, uh, nu știu, mi-e greu să, să dau seama încotro se va duce industria, e un accent uh, important, dar probabil că ce va uni și unde cred că nu vom greși, uh, vor rămâne, uh, va consta în aceste valori până la urmă de care s-a tot vorbit, dar poate că mai puțin le-am aplicat, creativitate, etică și responsabilitate. Cred că acestea sunt foarte, foarte importante și cumva unesc ceea ce s-a spus până acum. Niciun caz nu contrazic. Uh, au fost și până acum în piață. Poate le-am văzut mai puțin. Poate că e momentul acum să le vedem mai mult și să nu uităm să ne aducem mereu aminte de ele, pentru că tendința e de a uita. Uh, vom, ne vom confrunta cu probleme mari. Uh, piața uh, nu cred că se va ridica ușor, să nu spun că e lovită, încerc să evit acest element. Uh, nu cred că se poate întoarce, așa cum spunea uh, și uh, vorbitorul de azi, uh, nu cred că se va întoarce la condițiile dinainte, dar asta nu înseamnă neapărat că va evolua. Și cred că e de muncă aici. Aici cred că e de muncă. Să ne luăm aceste notițe și să le punem undeva mare pe perete, să ne mai uităm din când în când la ele. Mulțumesc frumos! Altfel, o, o altă nuanță importantă cu privire strict la accesul acesta online, mi se pare că, într-adevăr, deschide un orizont uh, incredibil și pe tema uh, accesului. Până la urmă, sunt și persoane care, așa cum spuneam, nu preferă să zboare sau uh, sunt uh, din motive personale sau din alte motive ușor discriminate de cele care au un program mai flexibil uh, din perspectiva familiei sau se dedică mult mai mult uh, acestor călătorii. Acestor... Cred că ne va ajuta foarte mult posibilitatea de a ne conecta virtual. Nu știu cum va afecta asta industria aeronautică și altele de transport și așa mai departe, dar e o dimensiune importantă de luat în seamă, uh, poate pentru zona mai degrabă a celor care activ în acest domeniu al non-discriminării, gândiți-vă că sunt persoane care trăiesc în izolare din alte motive decât pandemia de mai mult timp. Fie, mm. Pentru că au unitate slăbită, fie că, nu știu, le e frică de avion, fie că, pur și simplu, au anumite probleme care le împiedică și 
dacă tu ne întoarcem la umanitate, e un aspect interesant. Dar era doar, era doar o stăluță, un astfel de experiență. atunci, democratizarea asta overnight a conectării prin videoconferencing devine un, o soluție accesibilă mult mai multor comunități și care aduce oamenii mai aproape, mai ușor. Mie mi se pare, însă, poate cel mai important din toate este semnalul de a continua. De a continua în ciuda dificultăților care par inerente, a preconizatei crize, dar cred că a persevera, a continua, evident, uitându-ne la ce a fost și la ce am greșit și cum putem să schimbăm, dar mi se pare extraordinar de important și a continua la standarde poate și mai înalte, dacă mi-e permis. Din punct de vedere uman, creativ, aici e loc de foarte multe discuții, dar mă opresc aici. Mulțumesc la suflet celor care mi-au facilitat participarea și organizatorilor și, bineînțeles, interlocutorului. Mulțumesc și... Mulțumim și noi. Uh, care... Stay mai, safe! Mai avem câteva minute și eu aș vrea să îi ofer microfonul Dianei ca să ne mai povestească de câteva vești frumoase care, care urmează. Spuneam da. că aceasta este prima ediție dintr-o dintr serie. Știr, da. Diana... Următorul... Mulțumesc, Maria! Următorul webinar va fi pe 22 aprilie, la ora 10 dimineața. 28. Și va fi cu 28, pardon, 28 aprilie, la ora 10 dimineața și va fi cu profesor Loredana Păduran. Este româncă, cei care ați fost la prima ediție a Conferinței Globale ați văzut-o, dar ea este decan asociat al MIT în Asia, respectiv fondatoarea Asia School of Business, în colaborare cu MIT și este specializată pe management și pe inovație și antreprenoriat. Um, ea va vorbi despre cum să-ți inovezi business-ul în și după criză. Uh, este foarte specific acest curs al ei, mă rog, webinar, să spunem, pentru că ea a studiat și a discutat cu foarte mulți, uh, mă rog, CEO de tot felul, tot felul de companii uh, și a ajuns la uh, concluzii cum să arate business-ul mai departe cum să ți-l reformatezi, regândești ca atitudine, ca behavior, acum și după ce, mă rog, după ce se reia cât de cât activitatea economică, chiar dacă în etape mai lente, dar se va relua oricum. Deci, cred că este e o perspectivă academică, dar e o perspectivă foarte aplicată pe exact zona de management și antreprenoriat și cred că aici a foarte mulți oameni, indiferent că sunt freelancer sau marketing sau comunicare sau ar trebui să se uite, pentru că ne propune o cu totul altă abordare a business-ului în general. Uh, un alt speaker care va fi pe 28 mai de data aceasta, va fi la 4 după amiaza în România. Încercăm să, nu le, încercăm să le punem ori dimineața, ori mai spre final de zi, că poate lumea are întâlniri. Este Frederic Borstrom din, de la LinkedIn, care va vorbi exact despre business to business. Atât în criză, dar și în general principiile de business to business și cum spunea și Rory, este un, o zonă pe care foarte mulți au evitat-o, să zic, în publicitate mai ales, pentru că nu este foarte... Uh, glamorous, da? Nu are așa o patină și o aură și o strălucire, că poate nu se vede, nu poți să faci glumițe la televizor, nu te vede, nu te vorbește nimeni. Um, cu toate astea, este o sursă de venit și, pe de altă parte, este și o sursă de multă strategie acolo, cum să abordezi business to business communication. Deci, el va vorbi specific despre acest lucru uh, și cred că, din nou, poate să fie interesant pentru foarte multă lume. Și mai suntem în discuții cu, nu l-am făcut încă, mai suntem în discuții cu un, uh, avem și noi un uh, munte sacru, un director de creație care uh, a transcens granițele României, a ajuns internațional, a ajuns să fie votat cel mai bun om de creație al uh, regiunii EMEA uh, și anume Adrian Boțan. 
uh, și probabil că va fi în jurul datei de 15 mai, dar suntem încă în finalizare și pe ăsta nu îl putem anunța, ceilalți sunt, uh, sunt set. Așa că vă invităm, participați. Ideea pe care noi dorim să o facem este și de a fi live cu acești oameni, de a le putea pune întrebări, dar și a avea learning-uri specializate pe nevoile și ale noastre până la urmă. That's the point. Mulțumim frumos! Mulțumim tuturor că v-ați alăturat că am fost împreună astăzi, că, uite, zâmbim împreună, e un alt fel de selfie, nu? Asta din Zoom. Aș vrea să vă spun că este și pentru noi experiență de învățare, experiența asta e o experiență de învățare și vrem să fim mai buni și vrem să fim mai relevanți și vrem să creăm experiențe mai plăcute împreună, așa că o să primiți după, după sesiune acum fiecare câte un link în care vă vom invita să dați feedback-ul vostru, o să vedeți în e-mail eu un buton de Ad Review, ne-ar ajuta tare, tare mult dacă vă luați două minute, nu durează mai mult, să ne dați feedback-ul vostru, să știm ce a fost bine, ce a fost interesant și ce v-ați dori mai departe, ca să aducem nu, valoare și, și relevanță în și după criză. Și cu acest gând, Victor, dacă vrei să închizi tu într-o notă optimistă. Vă mulțumesc tuturor pentru participare și pentru încredere. Seria asta de webinarii, v-a spus, cum v-au spus și colegii mei, are și o componentă de toate pânzele sus și de păstrarea sentimentului de apartenență la o comunitate și sperăm să găsim în fiecare dintre ele câte o, câte o idee pozitivă cu care să plecăm acasă și care să ne facă să parcurgem mai ușor perioada asta neprevăzută. Rămânem aproape și... Verificați-ne aseturile online ca să vedeți programarea următoarelor evenimente. Iar dacă aveți propuneri de evenimente, propuneri de teme, idei de dezbateri, noi vă suntem aici și putem crea oricând un cadru în care să discutăm tot ce, tot ce propuneți și ce simțiți nevoia să aprofundăm. Da. Da. Mulțumesc și o zi bună! Mulțumim mult! Mulțumim! Paște fericit tuturor! Ne revedem în curând. La revedere, pa, pa. La revedere, pa, pa. Manuela, Manuela, îți voi scrie, da? Pe e-mail.